Um, I'm Rachel Wien, I'm the programming manager here, and Zeb Rassman is here today to speak about his latest adventures, um, which we'll get to in a moment. Um, I just wanted to remind you of a few things before we get started. Um, the restrooms are outside to the right in the hallway there. We do have hearing assistance units available if you need those. They're on the back table there and someone can show you how to use those. Um, I'd like to thank our sponsors today, Coffee by Design, who always provides coffee for uh, our brown bags. Um, I'd like to thank Whole Foods Market anyway. They donate twice a month but for our brown bag lecture series, but unfortunately there are no cookies today because um, this is an off week. So, But we want to thank them anyway because it, come back next week. Um, WCSH, who's our media sponsor, um, and also Longfellow Books, who isn't selling books, but will when Zeb writes a book about his travels. Um, I like to remind people to check that your cell phones are either off or on silent. And um, I wanted to let you know about some upcoming talks that we have um, here at the library. Next week, Dawn Potter will be here speaking about her new book on poetry called The Poet's Source Book. Two weeks from tomorrow, um, Augustine Burroughs will be here speaking about his book, This Is How. Um, that's going to be a pretty uh, popular event, so come at 6.15 to get a seat if you're worried about getting a good seat. That's at 7 p.m. In, here in the Rhines. And on May 1st, we have William Barry speaking about Maine, the wilder half of New England. Um, so check out our website and also our monthly calendar has more information about our ongoing programming. Um, so Zeb is here to do his second installment on, on his adventures. Um, he was, is freshly back from hiking the Ozark Mountains, paddling the Bayou Tesh um, down south and a jaunt down to the West Indies, all of which were on the heels of his finishing the Appalachian Trail last year. Um, I, that's actually not updated from two weeks ago, so he might have done something else in between. I'm not sure, but I wouldn't be surprised. Um, He's going to speak about his travels along the way, um, and I, I, who knows what he's going to say. It's always entertaining, and we're really happy that you're doing it again, Zeb, so thanks for being here. Hey. Uh, thanks for coming out for part two. Uh, when I put this talk together, I wasn't quite sure what it was going to be. The last one went over pretty well. and So I'll probably revert to a bunch of the, the stories from the last one. For those of you that sat through it last time, you bear with me. But I've got a few good new ones and some, uh, some pictures to go along with it. Uh, I know in the write-up it said that I was going to have some friends here. And I invited a few of them, but it was kind of an oversight on my part that through hikers are sort of hard people to pin down. And although they claim to live in Maine when I met them, none of them are actually in the state of Maine uh, at the moment. But I got some pictures from some of them and at least have the stories and can talk a little bit about who they were, how I met them, and still uh, get a taste of what kinds of people are out there wandering around in the woods. Um, so I'll get started with the Appalachian Trail and then I'll kind of move on to the, the other pictures I have are just from the trip down the Bayou Tesh down in Louisiana and I hiked the Ozarks, not, not the whole trail, I hiked uh, for about a week in the Ozarks down mostly in Missouri. The, the mountains go down into Arkansas, uh, into the Ozark Highlands and I got down there to check it out but didn't really spend much time hiking down there. It was getting kind of cold during that time and figured I'd better keep heading south and that was when I moved down into Louisiana and hung out down there for a while. So without further ado, I'll continue with the, uh, the talk itself. Here's Springer Mountain, the beginning of the Appalachian Trail. This is, this is the plaque that everybody goes to, kind of taps it and then starts walking north and for what it's worth. This, uh, this plaque, as I was just talking about with Dennis at the beginning here, is on the, the top of a mountain. The trail starts at the top of a mountain, so if you want to start the Appalachian Trail, you get to choose any way you want to get yourself to the top of that mountain. It's not like you can just take a bus or take a plane to the start of the Appalachian Trail. The, the nearest town that I found is right down, it's a little bit north of Atlanta, uh, Gainesville, Georgia, that I was able to take uh, Amtrak 
train from New York City to Gainesville and got off the train in Gainesville and still wasn't quite sure what exactly to do to get to, uh, to Springer. So I went and there was a taxi nearby that saw the backpack and I went and talked to him, asked him, you know, how exactly I go about doing this and he said he'd take me there for 120 bucks and <laughs> I, I didn't really like the sounds of that so uh, I told him I figured I'd just walk and he said, well, you know, it's 40 miles, right? Yeah, all right, it's, it's, 40, it's 40 miles. I, I figure there'll be plenty more to come after that. So through a combination of walking and hitchhiking, um, ended up making it to Springer Mountain a few days after that. Not all the hitches actually went in the right direction. I, I didn't know my way around northern Georgia that well. But on the plus side, I got to see a lot of other small towns of northern Georgia that turned out to be trail towns also, that were towns that people were hiking off to buy supplies at or to check out while they were hiking the trail. So for the first several, probably the first 50, 60 miles of the Appalachian Trail, all the hikers that I meet along the way would say, you know, oh, we're taking off going into Dahlonega or we're going to Helen, you want to come check it out? And I'd be able to be like, no, I already been there, done that. <laughs> So these are all, um, from the, the beginning, the first, first few hundred miles were like mountains that I'd never really walked in before. The Chattahoochee National Forest down in, in Georgia are just amazing. And they're, they're a little steeper than the mountains I was used to, and I didn't really do um, a lot of research in hiking the Appalachian Trail, and had no idea what the mountains were like that I was going to be climbing. And, it, I'm not going to say it was an unpleasant surprise, finding just how rough the, the trail actually is, but it, it, was, uh, it was a little more challenging than, than I'd expected. I sort of pictured this nice trail weaving in through valleys, and <laughs> now every summit that was there, it would ramp right up over it and then drop you back down and up over it and just day after day. And the, uh, the banks at first, going off the sides of the trail, are so much steeper than pretty much anywhere else that you, you find them which was, that was just amazing. You're walking along these sort of clefts in the mountainside, looking down, and on the misty mornings, you can't see anywhere down near the bottom. You're just looking down these slopes of trees, and then every now and then you get to a viewpoint like this. This is actually, this is reaching the end of the Chattahoochees. This is getting uh, closer to the Smoky Mountains. And this was a morning that I'd woken up and started hiking, um, I had a friend, Michael, that I'd met along the way. He wasn't actually through hiking. He was just out sectioning for, uh, I think, a couple weeks or so. He had a family and kids and things he actually had to get back to. Uh, <clears throat> but he made for good company while he was there. And then as, uh, as I grew to find out with section hikers, is you always want to become friends with them because when they stop hiking, they've got all this leftover stuff that they don't know what to do with. <laughs> And sometimes they have a car, which can uh, be useful, get into the next town, or uh, credit cards, too. Uh, this, was, th this is just the sort of, the sort of trail that you're seeing the whole time. Th these are some wood steps cut into it. The whole Appalachian Trail, all the way from Georgia up to Maine, is maintained by different volunteer groups. And they, they take a lot of pride in the quality of the trail that they're maintaining, and some of them will really try to one-up one the, uh, the other groups. You get up into the, the sections in New York, and the stonework in there is, it's like stonework that you don't see even in, even professionally done around town. It's, it's amazing. I'm working on that. There was a, in Vermont, there was actually a, a trolley car uh, that wasn't part of the Appalachian Trail, but you're hiking up over these ski mountains, and there was a trolley car that was running. So I had a friend of mine went over, jumped on it, took it down to town, bought a burger, jumped back on, <laughs> hit the trail. It took him less than an hour, and I, I was pretty impressed. Um, 
All along the Appalachian Trail, there are these little shelters, which are also built by the volunteer groups. This is on the smaller end of shelters. Uh, generally, the, the capacity for that shelter is listed as six. Um, I've seen as many as 13, 14 people <laughs> piled in there. You just sort of stack like sardines. Once you're in sleeping bags, it doesn't, n nobody really cares. But a rainy night, it's not like, not like you're going to be sitting out in the cold wondering uh, how awkward it's going to be jumping into the shelter. You just you, you go for it. Uh, the shelters are also where the, the fire pits were, which I, I found to be a big draw as, um, as kind of a pyro. I really enjoyed even the social aspect of just coming to a shelter, making a huge fire, and it has a way of gathering people around it that, that nothing else really works that well for making friends. You just build a fire and all of a sudden people start coming to you, especially if you put some food on it. Hikers tend to be <laughs> fairly hungry people. Uh, I've got a handful of trail pictures that, uh, before I go much farther, I should add, most of these actually aren't my pictures. I have friends that I've been hitting up who took the majority of their pictures. I had a little disposable camera that I was using and I only got maybe 50 or so pictures and I had some friends that were hiking it a little bit differently, had good electronic equipment and they uh, were hiking in a way that they could take better care of it so they have all these nice pictures which I've been, been borrowing from them. Uh, this was from my friend Skirt. We all get these weird trail names. It's, uh, it's part of hiking that within the first several hundred miles, you generally pick up a trail name from other hikers that something happens, some misdeed or accident. or so, so it generally, trail names come out of some incident involving shame. Um, <laughs> then from there, it kind of sticks with you and you get a nice trail name for the whole rest of the way up. After a few hundred miles, it almost becomes awkward not to have a trail name. You're all going around introducing each other, and you're like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm Cheddar, I'm Amish, and, and like, oh, I'm just Jeffrey. So, <laughs> I, it's kind of said with shame. There was one person I met whose trail name was Just Scott because he had to introduce himself as Just Scott so many times that people finally said, that's, that's just your trail name. That's, <laughs> you're, you're Scott. Um, this, this was my, myself and Shane, a uh, friend that I met early on and hiked with until most of the way through the Smoky Mountains. I hadn't quite gotten the hang of paring my pack weight down yet, and I've got a nice big bag of shiitake mushrooms hanging off the back, and I, for a while, was dangling stuff all over my pack because I didn't know how to stuff it inside. I ended up getting better as I kept walking. You, you learn that lesson the hard way. Um, here's, here's Poncho. Poncho was another person I met about the same time I met Shane. He, he was hiking down in the Smokies, and the, the Smokies are fairly isolated. You get to the national parks, and there's not a lot going on outside that draws other hikers away, the towns and everything. So you kind of bond together through the more remote areas in the national parks. And Poncho was someone that I met that way through the Smokies. In this particular picture, we had just gotten to a road. You'll see this is a, uh, a sign that they had at just about every road crossing down south where the Appalachian Trail crosses a road to let, let people know that that is indeed what's, what's going on, why these dirty bearded little boys are coming out of the wood, woods and scurrying back up. And, and, and girls, there are girls hiking the trail. There aren't as many of them, but the majority of the, uh, the hikers on the Appalachian Trail were young men about my age, and most of them fulfilled the stereotype of being bearded and smelling horrible. <laughs> this, uh, this picture, we're both in the state of euphoria. We, we came out of the woods and there's this green minivan sitting there. And an older, older guy in the front seat beckoned us over there and he said, hey, uh, I see you guys are through hikers. I came to the area to do some hiking. Not really into the weather. It, it was raining off and on. He said, so I'm, I'm going back I'm driving back home. Do you guys want some of my supplies? And, you know, of, of course, we'll take everything you got. And he gave us a huge bag of pistachios and, uh, and a bottle of tequila, which <laughs> this was right before the, 
the steepest climb and probably within 200 miles, Jacob's Ladder. It, one of those things you, you dread for days and days coming up to it. And uh, I don't remember it being so bad at all. <laughs> Here's another one of the campfires. Here we have uh, myself, Papa Tats. Eva's in the back corner and skirt, blue eyes. Uh, Papa Tats and blue eyes I only met for maybe a day or so in passing. And this was a fairly cold night, so in addition to the, the fire bringing people around for social reasons, we all needed the fire to, uh, just to keep warm. And in some cases, it will boil our water. Uh, one trick that you learn early on, if you've got a metal canteen, you can boil your water, and dump it in there, slip it in the bottom of your sleeping bag, and that'll, that'll stay warm through, through most of the night. Uh, not everyone likes to go with the metal canteens. They're, they weigh a little bit more, and everyone's got their own opinions on weight and gear and hiking, but that, that was one trick that's really come in handy for me. Papa Tats, I don't know what happened to him. I don't think he ended up making it. I, I heard he did something to his ankle back in North Carolina, but Blue Eyes uh, did what's referred to as flip-flopping, which is actually not that uncommon where you'll hike a certain distance north. He started at Springer Mountain. He hiked to about Hot Springs and then took a shuttle all the way up to Katahdin and then started walking back south from there. Katahdin opens later in the season than, uh, than Springer Mountain does, so most people, the majority of the thru-hikers, start at Springer and then start walking north. The, uh, the, the real southbounders, the, the true southbounders that just start at Katahdin and walk all the way down, tend to get started a little bit later, um, both because Katahdin doesn't open that early, and in going through the 100-mile wilderness, it's, it's a lot, it's harder in the spring. You've got bugs, you've got all these rivers to ford that are a little bit flooded. Um, through the rest of the Appalachian Trail, you've got these nice bridges all over everything, and for reasons that I don't understand, as soon as you get to Maine, there are no more bridges, it's just fords, uh, which I took as a matter of pride as a Mainer, I said, you know, that's, that's the way life should be, but uh, <clears throat> here we have the, getting close to the Smoky Mountains, uh, I didn't know what gators actually were, I, I, I knew what gators were for snow, but I hadn't heard of, like, hiking gators for rain, so when I got down there and saw all these people putting on gaiters, I figured I'd better at least try to look like I knew what I was doing and wrap plastic bags around my feet and spend a while arguing with people about how this is a better method before I decided I'd just go hike on my own for a while. Uh, and through the Smoky Mountains, you've got all these fire towers, these abandoned fire towers left over from uh, before we had the technology to fight fires without them. Uh, it, You'd have to hike sometimes half mile, a mile, to get off the trail and go visit them, but every single one of them was well, well worth the little extra time that it took. And it was a good chance to drop your pack off. You'd leave your pack on the Appalachian Trail, because not like anybody is going to steal it. And I figured if anyone did, I'd be able to outrun them twice as fast without a pack, and they'd be <laughs> going twice as slow with it. As long as they'd run in the right direction, I'd be more than happy. <laughs> Here's a, a hailstorm that we got caught in in Nantahala. This, uh, this also had a way of really bringing friends together, filled up this one shelter. Uh, not everyone stays at the shelters. There are people camping out in the woods. And so I was camping out maybe 100 feet from the shelter or so. I, I had a hammock through the whole time. And with this hammock, I liked staying in the hammock better than the shelters, but I liked meeting people at the shelters. So I generally camp out near the shelters to meet people, but wouldn't actually sleep in the shelters if I could help it. And this particular time, it had started raining and then started hailing on me. And being so close, it was nice and easy for me to pack up and get into the shelter. But the timing was just perfect that I, I got rained on, so it looked like I'd been out in it. And everybody that 
got forced in was, was looking over at me and you know, asking, oh, how far did you have to come in from? And they're all <laughs> suffering from miles and miles of trying to make it to this shelter. I'd be like, oh, yeah, it was a rough 50 yards or so. <laughs> Here's, uh, yeah, just more of the, the trail shots. These rhododendron bushes are all over down south. I, I don't have any pictures of the green tunnel, but that's what it's described as when you have rhododendrons coming up on both sides of the trail so thick that you're walking through what's just macheted, hacked out of these, these tunnels under the rhododendrons. And that in itself is fun enough, and then at a certain point they start to bloom. And it's just uh, such an amazing part of, of walking that everyone has their stories of where they were when the rhododendrons started blooming. It, it really changes. Here's Pinky. Uh, it was just talking about him a little bit before the talk. I met this kid in the Smoky Mountains, and I don't know where he goes to school, but his high school was actually giving him a PE credit to go out and hike the Appalachian Trail. <laughs> I, uh, I have my doubts about whether he's actually going back to high school after that. I, I think he <laughs> learned everything he needed to learn. And here's a few more of the hikers I was with. Until about Hot Springs, these, uh, these people were about as close to family as I got for that beginning of the trail. I'd hike with people on and off through, th through the whole trail. I hiked with probably 50 people or so. But not all of them I grew to be as close with as, as these people. And some of them you'd hike with for a day or two or a week. But generally, everyone had their own pace. And you'd hike with them just long enough until you felt like you needed to go your pace and they needed to go theirs. And then you'd move on to the next group. Here we have uh, Short Term, who uh, had started out initially thinking that he was going to take a vacation from his work and go out hiking for a week or so uh, until he met Eva here, second in. Well, this is Tank also. And then he met Eva, and Eva managed to talk him into hiking all the way up to Maine. <laughs> uh, then we've got Eva Gonzalez, who was a, a fellow Mainer. There, there are a, a number of Mainers on the Appalachian Trail. Uh, a lot of people who have grown up anywhere near the trail, I, I find, have this seed planted in them at an early age to go out and hike this trail that they know goes through their backyard, but don't really know where it ends up. And that, that seemed to bring uh, a more than, uh, more than adequate number of Mainers to give me people to talk about lobster and chickadees with. Uh, we have Trix, Aquaman, and Skirt on the side. Uh, all of them I ended up losing track with in Damascus, which is about a quarter of the way through the trail. And then was able to track down most of them afterwards and have kept in touch with a good number of them. After finishing hiking, I went down and visited uh, Mike and Eva, well, Short Term and Eva, who at that time were living down in, uh, in Tennessee. Eva used to live up in Vermont and after finishing with, uh, w with the trail. She'd never been down to Tennessee, so moved down there. And then Mike had never been up to Vermont, so he came up here for a little while. And, uh, here we have just the trail kind of meandering through. As you get up in the, the higher elevations, the, the forests get smaller and smaller, and they become these dense little alpine forests. And Klingman's Dome, halfway through the Smoky Mountains, you hit the highest point on the Appalachian Trail, which isn't the highest point by much. It, it just beats out uh, Mount Washington and Katahdin and Lafayette. And we have a few peaks up here that are, that are rivaling it. But on technicality, Klingman's Dome is the highest point on the Appalachian Trail. And you get to the top, and there's this huge structure that just circles all the way up to the viewpoint up there where you've got 360 degree views of all, all around the, the Smoky Mountains. It, it's pretty spectacular. What did you call it? Uh, structure? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So here's uh, another shot of just coming up the, up the ramp onto Klingman's. This is actually maybe a quarter mile off the Appalachian Trail itself, but as I found with so many of the, the little side trails. They're, they're well worth it.
And it's not uncommon for people to set up what's referred to as trail magic on the trail, or, or there'll be trail angels, where they'll set up um, a grill or just bring a whole bunch of food to spots like this that are more accessible to the public. Uh, even some of the fire towers, they'll, they'll drag food over to them and just feed hikers that go past. You know, we're, we're not people that have easy access to food while we're on the trail. It's generally a half a day, if not more than that, to hitchhike to most towns. There are a few towns that are right on the Appalachian Trail, but in most cases, the towns are just far enough away so that it makes a huge difference just to have someone give you a couple burgers and a few beers or whatever, whatever you can get out of them. Here's the, the second, after Klingman's Dome, the second part of the Smoky Mountains. It's all really just one big ridge line. You, you start walking up and you spend about a whole day walking up to the, the ridge line of the Smokies. Well, less than that if you're a faster hiker, but then you're just on top of it for maybe 80 miles walking this ridge line. And you're, you're going up and down a little bit, but the, the climbs, once you get up to the top, it's just walking and viewpoint to viewpoint. It's, it's really a nice part of the country. And here are the, the balds in North Carolina. These, these balds are just spaces that have been cleared on the top of the mountain. And they have little, uh, little trail markers where the trail isn't, isn't perfectly marked into it. You'll see the, the white blazes that are everywhere on the Appalachian Trail are just stuck into the ground and, and trail markers showing you which trails to actually follow. These are a lot of fun. I think this was a big bald in North Carolina where there's a series of balds that you're just hiking up and over. And from, each, from the top of each one, you can see the next one. So for days out, you can see what your day is going to be, where you're going to hike, where you're going to walk. It's really neat to be able to tell. I'll, I, will, I will have questions uh, at the end of it. Don't, don't worry. I'll, I'll leave a a significant segment for, for questions and answers. Uh, here's Sassafras and Snackosaurus. They were a couple that I met through, uh, through North Carolina. They were sectioning as far as Damascus. So they started at Springer and walked the first quarter of the trail. And they were a lot of fun. As I said with section hikers, always become friends with them. They ended up leaving me with a huge bag of gorp, like a gallon bag of of Gorp, homemade with chocolate-covered cranberries and some good stuff. Always remember that. Um, here's more of just the trail markers that I was talking about, weaving through the meadows and up and over the bulbs. It, it it takes it takes more more effort than you really think of walking it to maintain these things. And there's always people going out there and painting the blazes on the trees and having to repair these little stumps or, uh, or stakes or whatever the, the blaze may be on. The, uh, the one problem I found with the open trails was that they tended to get muddier than the, when you're in the woods. Even if the woods were muddy, you have stuff to grab onto. But these, you hit this on a wrong day and it's just a slip and slide all the way down there. At one point I spooked some deer going down one of these and you know that it's going to be rough going if you watch deer slipping <laughs> while they're going down. <laughs> I was like covered in mud by the time I was done. It wasn't, you know, you'd hit your side, you'd fall on your back, you'd, everything but face first into it, which I was grateful for that. I, I was lucky. I, I met people that they, they were covered on the front. Um, here's sunrise, or uh, the sunset near near the Smokies. This is probably a little bit after the Smoky Mountains. Oh, uh, <laughs> through hikers tend to be kind of mischievous, and Sex Panther actually was someone's trail name, so we <laughs> we figured we had to, you know. Uh, it, the trail names are a lot of fun because they they keep you anonymous. So if anybody gets into trouble, you you don't actually know. It was you know just some kid named Bonk, or <laughs> it was Sex Panther's fault. I don't know, he, he had a beard. Uh, the, there was a trail festival in Damascus where this church was offering free showers to any, any hiker that would go by. And it was all these, these older Baptist women running it. 
And when it was time for your shower, they'd all go down through a list and call out the names for whose shower it was, which was, I, I stuck around long after my shower just to watch these women trying to, like, they screaming out, is there a sex panther? Sex panther? <laughs> Through, uh, through the Grayson Highlands, it's the only part on the Appalachian Trail where you're going to find wild ponies. These things are fearless. They, they come right over and they start nibbling at you. They, I mean, they get fed a lot by people passing through, so uh, they're, they're really just trying to get some food out of you. But um, as trail names go, I have a, another friend that I met along the way who got his, uh, got his trail name from the Grayson Highlands. He was feeding some carrots to uh, a pony that turned out to be a, a female pony. And while he was doing this, a male pony came over and uh, decided to assert himself upon the, the female pony. And he was forever known as Pony Love after, <laughs> after that. I'm not sure that he adopted that nickname immediately. I think it took time of people badgering it and doing, but he ended up Ended up keeping it. Um, here's looking back over Hot Springs. Uh, Hot Springs is, it's really the first town that the trail hits that it goes right through the downtown area. And it, it's this little town, middle of, uh, well, not middle of, but middle of nowhere, North Carolina. It's a little bit outside of Asheville. There's not a whole lot going on there other than that the Appalachian Trail goes through there. So it's a real friendly, Real hiker-friendly town. It's got the the bars there are all used to being a little bit flexible on people's hygiene and this, that, and the other. They have outdoor seating. They they know to always have ice cream on hand. <laughs> uh, here's another shot of the Highlands. You can't see them that well, but there are uh, a whole bunch of ponies grazing off and the distance and then the trail hooks up around here and over the rock pile there. The highlands were also kind of neat because they were the first part on the trail that were cleared to this extent that had a, a much more western feel than, uh, than the, the woods that you'd been traipsing through up until this point. Ooh, James River, this is the uh, longest footbridge on the Appalachian Trail. And when I got to it, it's, it's maybe 30 feet out of the water. And I, I'm not bad with heights, but I don't like jumping off of things for no good reason. And I was with two other hikers that it was the end of the day. It had been a really hot day. And we all sort of threw the idea out there of maybe jumping off the bridge. And none of us wanted to at first, but one by one all decided to jump off the thing. Ended up being the most refreshing thing I'd done in a while. And uh, it, it's, it's one of those small traditions on the Appalachian Trail. There are a number of things that you, you just do for the sake of doing them. If you cross the trail on uh, Mount Washington, if you cross the cog tracks, you have to moon it. It's just tradition. <laughs> oh, here we got Betty. Betty was uh, Pony Love's aunt. And I met Betty... I didn't know that she was related to Pony Love at first. I came out of the, uh, the woods to a little logging road and was about to pass back into the woods. And Betty rolls down her window and calls over, you know, are you, are you hungry? And that's just a rhetorical question, I figured. So I came over and um, started seeing what was in her trunk. And the, it was like a mobile gas station. It just, she popped the thing open and there was lunch meat, candy, sodas, everything but beer in the trunk and pony love came along and told me that uh the the deal with betty was that she was his aunt um, but he he hadn't talked to her in a long time and she was meeting him at every road crossing and uh, giving him all this food and he seemed actually kind of disappointed in it i, I i'm like i don't really see the problem she has food we need food <laughs> and, but he was he was moving much faster than uh, than anybody that I'd met on the trail. So for him, it was actually a, a detriment. So I explored the option with him of maybe like trading clothes or something. Like, could it, <laughs> she could be my aunt for a little while. Um, when that didn't pan out, I figured I better just keep up with him. And he moves about 30 miles a day, which at that point in the trail was, it, it was really pushing it for me. 
but at 30 miles a day, Betty, 30 miles a day, uh, <laughs> she kept, she'd take requests also, which was amazing. She came back at one point, in this particular scene, she had come back with uh, root beer floats for <laughs> myself and everybody there, and I, I, I tried to convince her to be my aunt instead of his, but uh, no dice. And we've got, in the background, Grandpa Detour and Shaggy. I, by the time uh, other hikers started figuring out what was going on, Pony Love had this trail following him wherever, wherever he went. Here's uh, the priest looking back over three ridges. This is hitting the end of the trail in Virginia. This is one of the last big climbs until, uh, until the Shenandoahs. Um, through, uh, through the whole, the whole trail, I was actually having friends here from the library send me all kinds of food, and I, I would generally be as uh, nonspecific as I could about what to send, and so it was just good fun to eat whatever would come my way, and in this particular situation, I had a pound of fluff that came my way, and it, it, it was actually amazing. I'd sit down for a snack, and I'd have my pound of fluff, and I'd just take out a jar of peanut butter and sit there and one spoon into one, one into the other. Your diet changes, usually for the worse when you're out hiking. Uh, I ran into a number of parents that were hiking with their, their little kids on the, the Appalachian Trail and they'd hear you're a through hiker, they'd start to say, you know, what, what could you tell my child that would want to make them hike the Appalachian Trail? I'm like, that is so easy. You get to eat candy all day long. <laughs> Here's uh, this nice brewery right after, um, right after the priest in Three Ridges. This is the Devil's Backbone Brewery. Um, one of the hikers I was with, Grandpa Detour, I don't know where he found out that this brewery existed, but as we're hiking past, he threw it out there that there's an award-winning microbrewery less than 15 miles from the trail. Maybe we should all go there. And it didn't take much convincing to have I think there were eight or nine of us at the time uh, all decided that that was where our night was going to end. Uh, I ended up beating all of them to the brewery, and we had called ahead to, to warn them that we were coming, just sort of a common courtesy, and to make sure there was outdoor seating, which, which there was, and um, showed up there, and the, the manager was so into having hikers there. I didn't even get to open the door. I walked up, and he, he opened it, started introducing me to all the wait staff, and by the time the rest of my hikers had showed up, I had this nice table laid out with plates and the, the drinks were flowing and they sent us out to camp in the yard afterwards. We, we were in no condition to actually go back to the trail. <laughs> so they sent us out into the yard with four free growlers of beer and then uh, woke us up at nine the next morning with two more, uh, <laughs> brought us in, made us breakfast. This is a this is a, like a barbecue and brewery. This isn't a place that actually serves breakfast. The cook came in specially, made us all breakfast, and then right around noon, we ended up getting back to the trail and still managed to get in a pretty good like 19, 20 miles until Waynesboro, which for, for starting at noon, I was, I was quite impressed with, with all of us. It was easy trail, but then Waynesboro, oh, amazing all-you-can-eat buffet. Here's uh, Sunset from McAfee's Knob. McAfee's Knob is one of those parts of the Appalachian Trail that pretty much everybody hears about it way before you get to it. It's this rock overhanging up over the uh, valleys, of, valleys and farmlands of Virginia. And I happened to make it up there for Sunset and met, you can't tell very well in the pictures, but in the, the corner there with his Stetson hat and his Willie Nelson braids, his pops, and, Pony Love's down there making dinner, and then we've got Hambone up there in the corner. Uh, Pops, I ended up hiking with on and off for maybe a week or so after that. This, the section down in Virginia from McAfee's Knob up through the Tinker Cliffs and into Troutville was really one of my favorite parts of the trail. Not, not, my, not my, all of my overall favorite, but one of my favorites. If you're ever down in that area and looking for a hike, I strongly recommend even getting up to McAfee's Knob is an easy enough day hike. Um, here's Troutville, Virginia. Uh, I didn't, 
have a guidebook through, uh, through hiking the Appalachian Trail. In, in part, it was just because my lack of preparation left me not realizing that guidebooks actually existed for the Appalachian Trail. I knew there was something, obviously something out there, but didn't realize that the most popular one, the AWOL guidebook, was, was being used by everyone except me. And as such, I ended up in this little town in Virginia where nobody else seemed to be going because there's another little town nearby that actually has things that hikers would want. Uh, but this one, I found the town to be, even though they didn't have the Cracker Barrel and the, the McDonald's and wh whatever horrible things we all slink off to as soon as we get into a town, uh, I found the town to be a really nice hiker-friendly place. The, the, the firemen in the local fire station, they let me do my laundry there and they let me shower there. They, they told me as soon as I got there that there was a trail festival going on that weekend. And at first I kind of brushed it off. I wasn't really taking days off while I was hiking and the idea of taking a day off for this trail festival wasn't, wasn't in the cards for me. Uh, then through a little bit of convincing and a fairly eye-opening executive meeting at the, the fire department, uh, I decided that it would be, a, be in my best interest to stick around. They let me sleep in the gazebo. Uh, I went and rounded up a few other hikers and told them that, you know, there's a, a trail festival going on here. Uh, I'm the only hiker here. Uh, there's all kinds of free food, free stuff, free showers. You start saying free on the Appalachian Trail and people start really coming in in droves. So, uh, yeah, they, they fed us pretty well. There were five of us to take down a feast that would, uh, w was meant for a lot more than five people. We, we did what we could, though. Um, oh, here we are still plowing through the feast. We have Bam and Ambassador Apollos hiding behind the post. They had a 5K at the, uh, at the trail festival. I thought it was a bad idea to run a 5K in the middle of the Appalachian Trail, but Apollo didn't, so uh, props to him. Oh, made, made the papers while we were there, too. That, that was always fun. Here's um, Trail Bill Trail Days. We have the whole fire department there. That, those, those were some real fun guys. I'm, I'm hoping I get a chance to go down and go to this trail festival again as a, as a non-hiker and maybe uh, actually do my part to bring food and instead of just consume all of it. Here's Pops giving a speech. He was, he was quite the orator. Um, as, as things went, when I was at the trail festival, I was really hoping that Pops would show up. because so I figured if there's anyone that can just stand up there and tell it how it is, it, it's Pops. And that's exactly what he did. Uh, there's a gas station, a little bit, little bit down the road from Trailville. This is probably a few more days in. You really grow to appreciate gas stations in a way that you don't at all in the real world. Uh, I'm not the kind of person that would go into a gas station normally and order three chili dogs and two sodas and a half gallon of ice cream and then go back and do it again three more times. But the, uh, the cashiers get pretty used to this kind of behavior when four or five hikers show up and you go in and you buy everything that you think you need or that you can carry out of there. And then you go outside, you eat it on the front steps, and then you walk back in and you buy more. They just, it's how hikers work. Uh, here's a little, I, I named it Bambi, but I, I don't think it really responded to the name. This deer hiked with me for uh, not quite a mile, but, uh, it just, I came upon it, its mother, and one of its siblings while I was coming through the Shenandoahs on a fairly rainy day. Spooked them all. The mother and Fawn took off in one direction, and this one wasn't really the sharpest tack in the shed. Uh, took off in the wrong direction, came back, starts looking around for mom, looks up at me, and figured I was good enough, and just started, <laughs> yeah, called it even, started hiking with me. And, so I was walking and walking, this little deer is following right behind me, healing just like a dog. And I got to feeling pretty bad about it because I thought, you know, I'm going to be responsible for the death of this young deer. I can't take care, care of a deer. I can barely take care of myself out here. 
And I'd every now and get down and get in its face and just scream at it and tell it to like go, run away, go, go. And anything I could get to spook it and it wouldn't, wouldn't have any of it. It just uh, kept going and kept going. And I, I got to like thinking, how does this actually play out? You know, a couple of days in, if I roll up to a shelter, I have a baby deer with me. Is that <laughs> gonna be a problem? Um, new, new trail name coming, maybe. Uh, Ended up working out though. I, I guess deer are fairly territorial. They, they live out much of their lives within a fairly short radius. So I got not, not too far from where I had spooked the thing and looked back after going around a turn and it wasn't there. So I, I'm assuming it lived, I'm, I'm hoping it lived. Here's the farmlands that you see walking through large parts of Virginia you're just looking down at valleys like this. This one isn't the Shenandoah Valley, but it's the sort of, this is what you see in the Shenandoah Valley and for miles and miles on either end of it. Through, uh, for the, the most part, you're not really walking down into these little towns. You're just following ridge lines. But every now and then, it'll weave down off of the ridge line if you need to get water. And it's, I, I think at this point in time, I was probably uh, June, I was hiking through here. And that was, uh, I couldn't have been happier spending my summer. Just This is what you see when you're going to bed at night, what you see when you're waking up, you get to see the sun rise and set over the ridge lines in the back. This ridge line in the back isn't particularly even, but a number of the ridge lines through Virginia, you get up onto them and they just, it's, it's right flat across. You just walk these ridge lines for sometimes 10, 15 miles at a time, if not more. Um, towards the end of the Shenandoahs, I grew to question um, whether I wanted to, to actually stay on the trail. I, I didn't reach a point where I was sick of hiking enough to get off of it, but you spend so much time walking through the woods that at some point you're gonna start to ask yourself, like. It, do I have a good reason to actually keep going? And towards the end of the Shenandoahs, I had sort of a rough go of it, been rained on a lot, had all my, my gear soaked through. Uh, at one point, I got halfway through cooking some mac and cheese on an open fire, had all my clothes out to dry, which had previously been soaked for a few days. Thought that I was finally gonna get things dried out. And this storm came in and just soaked all of it Douse the fire, I, like eating half-cooked mac and cheese, sitting under like a little information kiosk in Shenandoah Park. It was one of those moments where it just makes you think, why, why am I here? And then there are tourists driving by and like snapping pictures of you while, <laughs> while this is going down. Uh, the, the Shenandoahs, it, there aren't many places in the, in the trail that that sort of thing would happen, but in the, in the Shenandoahs you get people that don't really understand what you're all about with, with hiking and they, they kind of keep their distance when they could actually, you know, maybe a change of clothes would be nice or even, even a little bit of food, like the, the mac and cheese was uh, not the most palatable thing I've ever eaten. So as I got towards the end of Shenandoah National Park, I, and this isn't all that uncommon on the Appalachian Trail, I decided that I needed a little break from it so I bought um, a little inflatable, that's a wave racer, it's sort of like an inner tube that you tow behind a motorboat, uh, jumped into the Shenandoah River and floated for uh, about 40, 50 miles until Harper's Ferry where the trail crossed the Shenandoah River again. And that was the whole time I was hiking. The, it took me two days and three nights. That was the biggest break that my feet got. They felt amazing after, after I was done just having my feet up the whole time, dipping them in the river. And in this picture, you can actually see a deer crossing in the, uh, in the rapids up ahead. I, I didn't plan out the Shenandoah River particularly well either and didn't know there was gonna be, uh, be white water on it. But most of it turned out to be fine. Um, at night, you'd just wake up when you'd hear it and start paddling immediately. Um, the, the current was just enough so at night I could usually drift for maybe five, six miles and then wake up at sunrise and watching the sunrise over the river and at early in the mornings you get these little bubbles that are all starting out and it, 
it was really a nice rhythm to the day, which led me in many ways to do the, the Bayou Tesh afterwards. I liked the, the rhythm of paddling so much. I mean, I liked hiking, but paddling was such a, such a different way to travel. Here's the, those little bubbles early in the morning. You're watching the, the sunrise come up. Uh, the, the white water didn't end up being a problem until the end. I hit like a class three rock garden that was a little bit of a problem to get through. But what, uh, what was a problem was after I was done with all of it, I was still conditioned to uh, the, the idea of waking up in the middle of the night, hearing the white water and feeling that I needed to jump into action. And it took me about a, a week or so at least to break that cycle where I was waking up in my hammock after I started hiking again with this urgent need to, to jump into action, to feel like I needed to, to do something immediately. And then I'd look around, there's nothing to do. I, there's no white water. I'm just sitting in my, in my hammock. Uh, but it took a while for my brain to kind of cycle the river back out of it. Uh, I met these guys while I was hiking down the river. They, um, they had a separate cooler for their, their beer and their Jaeger, which was drifting away from them a little bit. And I, um, I didn't have a paddle. What I had was my hiking stick with a trash can on it. But it was enough of a paddle to get over and rescue their beer. And, and we became friends pretty much immediately. Uh, and then when they were done, they were kind enough to leave me with a, a few for the road, or the river in this case. Here's uh, Boiling Springs is another one of the trail towns that the Appalachian Trail goes right through the middle of it. There's a, a nice loop in the middle of town that goes around a fishing pond, and the Appalachian Trail is blazed right along the loop. And then you get to the, uh, the ATC. I'm not sure if it's their headquarters, but it's some, some official office, office for the, the Appalachian Trail Conservancy that seemed like a good enough place to stop and take a break. And there's a hiker box behind it you can look through for uh, anything from food to medical supplies. Through Pennsylvania, you start walking through a lot of crops. Through um, the beginning and end of the trail, it's, it's, it's all just mountains, up and down, ridge lines, and then it flattens out, speaking relatively, through, uh, through Pennsylvania. You're still climbing mountains, but they're, they're not four or 5,000 foot mountains. And through much of it, you are just walking through, through crops, little trails that have been cut through the sides of it, which is a nice change of pace, but it's also really hot. And then Pennsylvania is also full of these sharp little rocks that uh, it's probably better not to talk about them. They still a traumatic memory. Uh, here's another one of those, uh, those fire towers that you can see as you, you get up to the top of the, the mountains. You, there's this dense little, th this alpine forest, just so much fun to walk through. In some cases, as you get up higher and higher, the trees even get short enough so you're walking through these alpine forests that are shorter than you are and you can look out over all of it. And when they disappear completely, there's nothing left to put the white blazes on. So the, the uh, trail maintainers just build these cairns, these big rock piles, and instead of following the blazes, you're just following rock piles over open mountain faces. Um, here's from the top of Mount Killington. The trail doesn't climb to the summit of Killington, but it goes close to the summit, and then there's an optional uh, blue blaze trail, which the, the Appalachian Trail is white blazed all through it, and then the side trails are all uh, blue, blue blaze, so they're just, if, if I refer to something as a blue blaze, it's just a side trail. Um, and then the water is generally blue blazed also. I had a friend of mine come out and hike part of the long trail. As I was getting closer to Maine, I was able to find more and more friends to come out and just hike with me for a day or two, and some of them even just would come out for a night. Here's um, getting up into the White Mountains. <clears throat> These are the, the Karens I was talking about. The trail just follows this ridge line. That's Mount Lafayette right there. And it follows these ridge lines, and you're just following little rock pile after rock pile. Uh, through, through much of the whites, this is the, the sort of thing you see through the presidentials. Uh, another view from Mount, uh, Mount Lafayette. Mount Washington is off in the distance. 
distance. It's not the closest mountain, it's the next, next range over. And this, the, the light doesn't reflect it, but this is just about at sunset. We were, we were up on, uh, on top of Mount Lafayette and we were able to watch the sunset from up there. At that point I was hiking with uh, San Hegan, who's a retired Marine that I met right before the Whites and hiked through most of the Whites with him. And this is the same, this is Lafayette, but this is looking back over the ridge line, um, back over the way that you come up it. Here's one of the shelters. This is one of the nicer shelters. As soon as you get into the White Mountains, the, the ATC is, um, or the, the AMC, sorry, is the one, the organization running things. They're more business-like than any of the other organizations. Well, they, they are a business. It's not a volunteer organization. So you get shelters that are more professionally done than the, the other ones. But in the end, it, all you really need is a roof and walls and somewhere to start a fire. So it was nice to have the, the change of pace. Um, the the Mahusiks, the Mahusik Notch is is so much fun. It's described by a lot of people as the uh, the hardest mile on the trail, but it's all what your definition of of a hard mile is. It it takes a long time to get through it, but it's like one giant playground. We've got uh, Tipsy and Coffee to go, coming up out of a cave in the Mahusik. It's just this big boulder field that you're going down into caves and coming up out of them, climbing up over boulders. Uh, here's my, my dad and my little brother came out um, just after crossing the border into Maine. They, they came and spent the night at a shelter, brought all kinds of food, and we cooked up food for the other people at the shelter that night. Oh, here's Chris Bear Jingle. I, um, I met him in the parking lot while I was waiting for my dad and my little brother. Uh, he, he came over from Poland. He wasn't through hiking, but he was just over here exploring parts of the Appalachian Trail. You get a, a good number of Europeans, mostly Germans, hiking the Appalachian Trail. I guess the story that many of them told me is that the their equivalent of the Discovery Channel ran a documentary on the Appalachian Trail, really romanticized it all. So you've got all these Germans that came over thinking that it's this amazing wilderness experience, and a, a lot of it, it's, it's fun, but there's a lot, uh, a lot that the docu documentary must have missed, because it's just like a lot of blisters and you know, all, all, the, all the other stuff that they, they left out. Oh, here's a, a shot of a watering hole up in the White Mountains. I had a friend came and, and met me, took me out, showed me one of, uh, one of her personal secrets of the White Mountains. Her and her husband showed me their, uh, their watering hole, and this was probably the first real bath I'd had in a few weeks, too. Um, this is looking out over... I think that's Moosehead Lake, if I remember. This might, I, I could be wrong, but uh, this is in Maine, slightly after the, the height of land. It's this um, that nice overlook that the trail comes fairly close to. And here we have the, the Bigelows looking out. You can see just the edge of Sugarloaf there, and the trail doesn't climb to the, the summit of Sugarloaf, but it goes pretty close to it, and then it hooks around over the Crockers, down, up onto the Bigelows, over the whole Bigelow Range. That was, for as Maine goes, that is one amazing section of trail. If any of you are ever looking for just a, a good way to spend a weekend or want to get out and hike some part of the trail in Maine, the, the Bigelows are really, they are spectacular. They're not, they're not easy. They, uh, if, you, if your knees aren't particularly in good shape, the Bigelow Mountains won't really do anything to make them in better shape. <laughs> um, but the views from the top, are, they, they rival just about any, any other piece of the Appalachian Trail. I'd say there were some views down in the Smokies that were amazing. There was Blood Mountain down in Georgia. And then from then it was just Lafayette, the Bigelows, and Katahdin were 
some of my favorite peaks on the whole trail. Here's some road walking. The, the trail tends to borrow roads to get over bridges at, at times. As you get closer to Maine, they, they don't seem to believe in bridges as much. But this was uh, New Hampshire. In, uh, in Gorham, New Hampshire, it borrowed this road for about a quarter mile to get over one of the rivers there. Um, here we have the Kennebec, which used to be a river that you were supposed to ford. And I guess, I don't think anyone ever ended up drowning, but there were a, a number of instances where it was enough of a problem that they now have a, a shuttle service that's offered. All right, the, and they must have had the shuttle service since then. Yeah, it's just a volunteer in a canoe that shuttles you across the river. That was, this was also on my birthday, so I uh, made it that much better. When I, when I first got to the, uh, the shuttle, my mom was waiting for me on the other bank, and I told all the other hikers it was my birthday, and they let me go across first. <laughs> so here's a, a picture of my birthday party. Um, I told my mom to just bring, bring cake and food and a bottle of Allen's coffee brandy. And, um, we have Tex, who I, I met Tex way back. I met him in North Carolina and lost track of him for about a thousand miles. And then we crossed paths again somewhere in the White Mountains and towards the end just started hiking together more and more and reminiscing about the, the, the good old days, even though it was only a few months before. But, uh, and then we have good medicine. <clears throat> and I think we had one other hiker. So between the four of us, we had a the whole birthday cake to ourselves. That was just pretty good odds. And into the 100 mile wilderness, this is another, another one of the fords. When I went through, uh, the, the water levels were down enough, so I really didn't have many problems fording these places. But I got that, that uh, it just seemed kind of dangerous to me. It didn't seem like the sort of thing I'd want to cross if the water was running any, uh, any faster than that. And through the 100 miles, I ditched most of my gear. At this point, my backpack has shrunk to a nice 15 pounds or so. That was my birthday present to myself, was just get rid of close to everything. And did the last, last 130 miles of the trail with as, as little as possible. Not, not that I was able to move any faster for it. I just, the 100 miles is not something I really felt like rushing through. There's so much, so much to see there. Um, part of the way through the 100 miles, um, and this was in part because of a misjudgment on my part in getting rid of all of my stuff, which seemed like such a good idea until I ran out of food. Um, luckily, Standing Bear had run out of food also. And Tex was more than happy to go along with our shenanigans, so we decided to flag down a car that was driving um, on this old logging road and got them to give us loads and loads of food. And then as soon as the car left, we uh, scooted it all behind a rock and flagged down the next car. <laughs> <laughs> so by the, by the time uh, we started hiking again, we had cans of beefaroni and like a gallon bag of ripple chips. And all the other hikers that we met are just shaking their heads going like, how, how did you manage to get all of this food 60 miles into the 100 mile wilderness? Uh, it's just skill. <laughs> <clears throat> Here's um, just building a fire. Uh, this was a fairly cold night, so we built it next to a, a rock, and we were all kind of huddled around trying to get the heat to reflect back. And up uh, in this picture, this was actually in the town of Monson. We we met. One of the locals there at a, at a bar that claimed he'd take us out to this jumping rock. And we have, uh, Caboose here was a southbounder, so he had just started his hike. He was maybe a week into it, if that. And that was a lot of fun to get to hang out with someone who's on, on their end of it when we're all on the opposite end of it. We've got maybe a week left to go. And you can kind of see so many of the ways that you used to think about hiking and in, in the ways that 
he organizes his pack and his just his ideas about how to move down the trail. And it became uh, also with the, the cliff jumping. I, the cliff must have been about 35, 40 feet, which again, I don't like jumping off perfectly good structures. Um, so I opted out of it, but then Caboose decided to jump, and then one of us had to jump because we can't be shown up by a southbounder. And luckily, um, I, I think it was Trips. This is, I think it was Trips that ended up taking the fall and, and jumping off of it. And this is just up through the 100 mile wilderness. This is White Cap. Here's a view of Katahdin. Before you actually climb Katahdin, you can see it for days and days as, as you're walking along the trail. And you're just stopping and it, in complete awe of this, this mountain that it's not like any other mountains that are around you at the time. And just winding your way to it, slow and steady. Uh, part of the way through the 100 mile wilderness, we also ran into a group of college girls from COA and managed to finagle our way into their sunrise yoga session. Uh, here's the morning before climbing Katahdin. At this point, I had met a group of hikers, Hippity Hop and Tex, who I'd mentioned in Standing Bear. And they'd sort of become my, my second trail family of the, of the hike. We were all completely in sync with each other. We'd hike together. We'd take synchronized naps together on the side of the trail. We were just, it, we were pretty much inseparable. And we're all uh, just mulling around the, the ranger station here. Not really sure if we should start hiking or not, because we know that as soon as we reach the top of Katahdin, it, it all ends and we all have to go our separate ways. Um, here's Standing Bear and I think Hippity must have taken this picture. Standing Bear and then there's Tex and myself and a few other southbounders that are coming down. Uh, uh, they, they may have been flip-floppers actually. I seem to remember that they, they knew more about the trail than, than, uh, than I thought a southbounder would. Not, I shouldn't be too judgmental of them, but southbounders and northbounders always have this sort of clash around who's actually hiking the trail the right way. <laughs> uh, on our way up Katahdin, this is just after the tablelands, so we've got maybe a mile or so left to go, and it's the same sort of thing. You're having a lot of fun, just. In, in awe of the fact that this hike is, is finally about to be over, but at the same time, you don't, you don't want it to be over. So we took more breaks on the way up Katahdin than I think we had at any other point in time hiking. And then everybody has their, their summit photos from the, uh, the end of the trail. We've got myself, Standing Bear, Tex, Hippity, uh, one of the three of us, and well, afterwards, the only thing to do was to throw a party when we got home. These are my cousins who actually met me and hiked in, uh, in Pennsylvania for uh, a good couple of days with me. And, but I was kind of restless once I got home, so I uh, loaded uh, this little purple boat on the, the back of my truck and figured I'd better, better just take off and go keep traveling. And there's sort of... It, it's, a, it's a really strange time in everyone's life having finished the Appalachian Trail because you've, you've finished what's kind of a monumental achievement by most, most people's standards, but at the same time, you're still living on a day-to-day -day basis. And while everyone I'd, I'd meet was saying, oh, this is, this is amazing, this is amazing, I'm just, I was completely lost for, for direction, really. And you'd wake up and... You know, there isn't some white blaze to follow. You're not, you can't hike and find these amazing people miles and miles down the trail who have just hiked 2,000 miles to, to get here. And uh, part of why I took off was I needed to go find those people again. And so the people I met on the trail, I started looking them up and figuring out where they actually were in the country. And, uh, made some plans to go out and start visiting them and, and hiking with all of them. And 
most of them seem to be going through the same thing and were more than happy to to have me come come by and at least share in their general confusion at what life was all about now. So I, um, I headed down, among other stops, I stopped in with Standing Bear. And he, since finishing the Appalachian Trail, had basically just kept walking. He decided to be the, uh, the only person to hike the Appalachian and then the Ozark Trail in the same season, which, uh, although it is, uh, quite an accomplishment to do both the, the Appalachian and the Ozark Trail are two completely separate trails and the problem that I found with the Ozark Trail was that there aren't many people on it. The support network just isn't there. You don't have this vibrant trail community that is, I mean on the Appalachian Trail you're meeting people that have hiked in years past. They're just hanging out on the side of the trail. Some of them own lot, land there. Some of them are coming back to visit on a regular basis. And, even if they're not hiking, they're supporting the hikers that are going through the hike that year. And the Ozarks doesn't have any sort of concept of that. Um, but we did a good bit of hiking there. And <clears throat> went down through, uh, through the Taumsauk portion of the, uh, the Ozark Trail, which just about completed his, um, his goal of finishing the Ozarks and then, um, or finishing the Appalachian and then finishing out the Ozarks. And after that, it was starting to get a bit cold, so I headed down, started paddling uh, down in the, the bayous of Louisiana. Stumbled upon uh, the Bayou Tesh as this historic waterway that runs from uh, near, near Baton Rouge, it's probably 10 miles or so from Baton Rouge down to about the Gulf of Mexico. And just stayed on that. Uh, I met an outfitter down there who gave me a few connections to other locals that that enjoyed paddling not just the Tesh but the, uh, the the basin down there, the Chafalaya Basin. And they uh, they basically just helped me through, guided me through the whole whole experience of that paddling, which I wasn't very used to. I, I'd gotten pretty used to hiking and could handle myself there, but paddling, I, I had a lot of trouble just staying dry and keeping everything organized in a whole different way. Um, I'll just flip down through uh, most of these. I know we're sort of running low on time and then leave some time for the questions. But uh, going down through the Tesh, as you get closer and closer to the end of it, you hit the, the Chafalaya River. This is actually, this is the Charlatan Cut, but the Chafalaya River for uh, for being a river, it's just it's it's huge. Coming out to the end of it, it it felt a lot like Casco Bay, really, uh, with the the Casco Bay Bridge and the Portland Old Port. To me, I've got a picture of that. Um, here we go, coming down. This is the end of it. After going down through these swamps and bayous, you end up at just this this mass of of industry. You've got tugboats and barges going in and out and uh, but again, it's not, it's not the ocean. This is all on a river that's just up, up into the waterways. And the barge traffic from, uh, from down here tends to make it up for miles and miles up into the bayous. And uh, yeah, this was the, the end of it, the finishing up down in the end of the, end of the bayou touch. I made my way back home, visited a few more friends, stopped in to uh, some spots in North Carolina, I went, went back to the trail in the Shenandoahs, and even though the only people still hiking at that point were a few straggling southbounders, but it was a real cold time to be hiking. Still stopped out, and I'd leave beers and food for them by the side of the trail to do anything I could to help them get along. Uh, being a southbounder, it, it's really kind of a lonely way to hike it, because there aren't so many southbounders. And to make the choice to travel southbound is basically making the choice to not experience the trail community to the extent that, that the northbounders will. The people that are trail angling generally cater um, to the northbounders because they're just they're way more accessible. If you want to make sure that you find someone to actually receive the the food that you're cooking or whatever you're trying to offer to people, it's it's really kind of hard to hit the 
the 50 to 70 southbounders that uh, it's not a lot of people that actually complete the trail going south each year. So that that's all uh, that's all I've got for for the pictures.